Uh, so a couple weeks ago, Cody asked me if I'd talk to you guys, and I gave myself a challenge to make a song from scratch using exclusively uh, Ableton audio effects and plugins and sounds uh, all from the stock library. Because I feel like uh, one of the things that really allows uh, somebody who's making music professionally to make music professionally is uh, fairly expensive plugins and, uh, you know, different additions and, and external hardware and synths and things. And by the time you get into it all, uh, it can get very expensive very quickly. So I wanted to kind of show what was possible, uh, on a budget, if you will, uh, how you might be able to get it right out of the bar. Cause I remember for years being frustrated with the fact that I couldn't get it, anything that I was making to sound like, uh, you know, what I considered professional. Um, and so I guess just a little bit about my setup. I'm, I'm over here at Cody's house cause I keep having technical difficulties getting this, uh, all the screen capturing stuff to work. Uh, but we're all learning new stuff here. So, um, this is kind of my travel setup. Uh, I got this thing, uh, I don't know, I guess a couple months ago, and I absolutely love it. I have a full-size version of the MPK, or I shouldn't say full-size, I have the MPK-49, and then this is the second-generation MPK Mini. Uh, you can pick these things up for about 100 bucks, uh, even less used if you're willing to get used. Uh, you know, check eBay and stuff like that. Uh, great piece of equipment. I would highly recommend getting something along this line. It doesn't have to be an Akai. Um, Akai integrates very, very well with Ableton, but any MIDI keyboard uh, with velocity sensitivity uh, just makes the workflow a lot faster. Um, and for me, that's kind of what it's all about, is being able to get whatever idea I have in my head out into Ableton or whatever uh, DAW that you choose to be working with, whether it's Pro Tools or Ableton. But I know this is a class about Ableton, so, uh, Let's get into it. Um, I have this song fully laid out in the arrangement view, um, but I'm going to go through it in a session view and kind of break down piece by piece, um, show you how I make kind of, you know, little tips and tricks on, on how you can get, um, really expand on, on MIDI uh, and kind of break this song down. I'm having a hard time with audio routing, so the way this is gonna work is I'll uh, go through it all with just my internal computer microphone, and it's gonna sound kind of garbagey. Uh, and then at the end, I'll change the audio source so that it's routing right into the screen capture. Uh, and we'll be able to play the song, how it's arranged, uh, you know, in its entirety. Uh, with high quality audio, so you guys can hear it all. Uh, first things first, I might be hitting some hotkeys, um, you know, short keyboard shortcuts uh, within Ableton. I'll try to explain those as I go, but it's a very Googleable list. Um, if I do breeze over everything, learning your Ableton hotkeys is one of the first things that I would recommend as far as workflow goes. Um, and you'll obviously start to get more familiar with those and use the ones that you end up needing to use more often. Um, I know I'm not supposed to touch my face, but I washed my hands recently and I have a bad habit of it. So uh, here we are. Without further ado, let's get into some of this. Uh, so uh, the way this song actually started out um, was an iPhone recording. Um, of just me drumming on my leg. Um, and when you first drag it into Ableton and it's unwarped, uh, this is what it sounds like. That's the whole song. Let's stop that. So this is, this drum loop, it's a little fast. Um, I actually ended up warping it, slowing it down, adding some reverb and stuff. It doesn't sound anything like this when it's all said and done. So I'm going to go through um, and just start by warping it all. Uh, and I'm going to try to rebuild this whole song um, start to finish to get as close as I can to what I have it arranged as. 
Um, so this is just literally a, a voice memo recorded that I plugged into iTunes, dragged and drop. Here's drag and drop audio. Ableton does, uh, I do find it to be a very intuitive program, and the more that I, the more that you kind of force it to be intuitive, the more you'll kind of like figure out on your own. Um, but here we go. So I'm going to start just by warping it. Um, and I know, uh, so I like to operate in um, kind of increments of four. I usually work in four, four. This song is in four, four. I don't know if, uh, for those of you who know music theory, you have, you know, different, uh, you can, you can change the timing in Ableton, but right now I want to integrate everything that I'm making to the global uh, metronome. And so when you just drag audio into it, uh, it's not going to be set to that. So with warping, um, I'm going to be fitting my drum. I want my drums to fit onto Ableton's grid, if you will. And that way, anything else that I add and apply to it will be in sync with that. So you can see that if I got my metronome turned on, um, I've got my sample warped, but it's not... I haven't warped it yet. I just clicked on warp. So Ableton's going to try to play this at 88 beats per minute, which is what I have this song set to. Um, but as you heard when I played the loop uh, from just dragging it in, it's a lot, it's a lot faster than um, 88. So you can hear that even though Ableton slowed it way down, so this is, it's not actually hitting right on the metronome. So I'm going to go through this and start to line things up. First of all, I'm going to, I'm going to find my one. So you can see this little tail. I've already got it set to one just because I did a little bit of prep work here. So if I go through this now um, and I hit play, my metronome's on. It's my one, my first beat and the metronome should hit at the same time, but then because if I zoom out here a little bit, you can see that some of these hits aren't dead on the grid. They're pretty close, but some of them aren't. So if I play this now, you can hear that it's close, but I'm still not dead on. And the reason I'm spending so much time on this, it's a really small part of the song, but this I've seen more people screw this up, and then the, as soon as as soon as you're not set to your to your global BPM, as soon as you're not set to Ableton's metronome, nothing that you add in is going to be able to talk to each other. Um, so you really want to be able to, you know, kind of get good at this um, if you're going to work with your own samples. So you can kind of think of this. You can kind of think of these little yellow things as pins. So you're kind of pinning that chunk of audio in place. Um, and really once you know the grid and once you can trust your grid, you can see these, you know, 1, 1 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 grid. Those numbers will change whether you're zoomed in or out. So depending on how precise you want to get, uh, you can really zoom way in. Um, I've done this enough where I'm just kind of confident with it. So a lot of times I'll zoom way in and then I'll just start dragging stuff around uh, and just drag it to the grid. G drag it as close as you feel like you want to get it. Um, you know, and you can really take your time and zoom like way, way in. And if you're really trying to be precise, you can see where this little squiggle starts. That's right where you want that beat to happen. Um, but for sake of time, I'm just going to try to rip through this real quick. I'm not being super precise because I know the final song, this is, I have this pretty low in the mix. Um, but you can just kind of see, you know, uh, I'm just, I just want to get this as kind of as close to the grid as, uh, as I, as I, you know, as I can. And the, the more time I put into this, the tighter it'll be to that metronome. Um, but I'm just going to take, uh, you know, take some of the key hits and line them up just a little a little closer. And so now, let's see, that's kind of right where I want to be. 
So now I have, uh, I'll have a loop. Uh, And you can see that all of those beats now are on, on my metronome. And so now, no matter what else I put in here, whether it's a computer-generated sound or another sample of audio, um, as long as I drag my audio to whatever grid I'm trying to be on, uh, all of those things sh should uh, line up when I hit play. And so here's the other thing. When you first drag in audio, depending on how your settings are lined up, you might have to hit this loop button. Um, and then I happen to know that this uh, this little length, these little length bars um, down here, I know that 400 it, uh, will set me to a perfect 16 bar loop. And so if I go 400, hit enter, it's gonna take my one where I've started, go to the end here, which you can see is five, uh, and now I know that Ableton is going to treat this as a perfect 16 bar loop. So that means that as this metronome hits, uh, it should all be so as it, as it loops, it hits again. So if that, if that, uh, if that 400 was different, if I left that at 43 or 333, it would loop earlier uh, than I want it to, and you would hear that every single time that loop started over, I'd be a little bit farther off my metronome, and a little bit further off my metronome, and a little bit further off my metronome, because it's looping faster than Ableton's global BPM wants to be warping in 44. So you can, uh, it gets a little confusing, but if you're having issues with, uh, if it sounds sounds like something will be at sync at first, check your loop, double check that it's in an increment of four if you're working in four four, um, and that'll just help you line everything up. Uh, moving on, let's keep uh, trucking through the drums. I'm gonna ignore this first chunk for a little bit. This is uh, kind of one shots and sound effects. You can kind of think of that as like herbs and spices so like I want to build the meat of all this lay all this out and then we're gonna go back in and uh, I'll show you what I did with with the audio effects and um, and just little you know little one shots here and there just to kind of keep things moving and keep things more interesting uh, and so moving on to the drum so we have this part um, that's how I started out this whole thing uh, a lot of times for me, it's just a matter of keeping inspiration going. Um, and that's where I happen to start this song. Uh, so then moving on, I just loaded in a drum kit. I just I just went into Ableton's drum racks. Uh, found, found a kit that I thought would work. Um, all right, all right. You can see it. These little headphones things, uh, they'll they kind of pop up all over the place. Um, if you're hearing something, look for one of those little headphone things to be blue, uh, and you can make it go away. Or you can always hit spacebar. Uh, you know, you you'll get used to stuff like that if you're not already there. Uh, so I have my finished. I have the finished MIDI. What I've done. Um, I just kind of left it down low to cheat, um, but I'm gonna just go through here and uh, and kind of start one thing after the other, uh, and just try to build this song up kind of as quick as possible. So with my kick, uh, I just kind of added some some four on the floor uh, stuff to to just kind of keep it moving. So I added. Uh, you know, four kicks. Um, and that just kind of brings everything together because my drums, uh, the pocket drumming is still just a little off. And uh, 
and this just kind of locks it all together. Um, but you can also, I also ended up adding, if you see in here, uh, you know, a, a few little, a few little flares. This kicks actually a little bit early. Um, I'm going to do the same thing with, uh, oh, let's see here. Um, with this, so I actually have it. I'm just going to hold, so I'm, I held shift to select all these, and then I'm going to hold alt to duplicate these. Uh, and a lot of times I will just work clicking in the grid. Uh, if you wanted to, you can see that the, I just have this plugged into Ableton and it's already routed uh, to the pads or the, um, and you can really do, you can really play a lot very quickly. So if I wanted to record, uh, instead of clicking this in, I could record this in. Uh, let me see here. I want my count in to be one bar. That'll just, br like, when I when you click play, it'll just wait a bar to line everything up. Um, I'm just going to try to play along with this and then show you how I tweak that. So then you can see, uh, if I pull this up, uh, this is what I just played. You can see Ableton made it a nice four, uh, four bar loop or 16 bar loop. Um, and uh, you can see I'm off on a little bit of these. So I might just go in here, line all this up. Uh, and again, this is basically exactly what I did with warping in the audio. Um, I'm just making sure that this stuff uh, is lined up. But in this case, I actually did end up just, uh, just clicking these in. So I'm going to get rid of that. Sometimes it's just cleaner and faster. Uh, especially with kick drums, to just click those in. So we've got that. I'll keep moving on. Uh, once you got a good four on the floor, you can usually kill your metronome too, unless you want it. Some people like it on. Some people have a lot of trouble playing with it. You definitely want your notes to be on a grid. So whether you have to play it with the metronome or line your MIDI up afterwards, it doesn't really matter how, to, how you do it, but you definitely want... Uh, your things to be close to a grid. There's other rules of thumb, you know, if you're making electronic music, usually it's it's tighter. Um, you'll hear a lot of people say, like, especially in hip hop, you'll you'll hear about people working like off the grid, or they say like, oh, I, I really like it when my snares are early, or like a half beat early. Um, and that's kind of where you get into swings and stuff. Uh, and and you can do a lot of those with, uh, with Ableton as well. Um, it's just a mat, you know, like like with the kick drum, where I have I have it technically a half a beat early. If I solo this and we watch it real quick, uh, let's get the metronome on. You can hear it's just a little bit early that uh, this kick right on this two three. You can see I actually have it a half a beat. Um, It comes in just a little, a little early, and when that's together with these, uh, with the pocket drumming, it just adds a little variation, uh, kind of switches things up for people. But let's move on to the uh, the rest of the kit here. Um, so this one is just. Uh, it's the same kit that that kick drum is from. I actually just ended up separating them out after the fact so that I could EQ my kick drum. Um, and that's a big thing. As a rule of thumb, when you're working, you want to try to separate all of your instruments because it makes it easier to mix later. Um, if you're working from a drum rack, Ableton has the ability to uh, 
it'll split all that out for you. If you're using a drum plugin, uh, it does get a little more complicated, um, which is one of the reasons why I kept it all exclusively to make, uh, like core instruments and effects and stuff. Um, and you can see me just kind of check around. One of the things I'll use all the time is shift tab. And you might know that tab will switch you over to arrangement view, but switch tab, shift tab will shift you from uh, being able to see your MIDI notes. Um, you know, so let's jump back to the kick for now. Uh, you can see your MIDI notes, or if you hit shift tab, you can see what you have for audio effects or MIDI effects or whatever. And you can see that I already have this compressed and EQ'd. I did a little bit of, um, I honestly, I'll put compressors and EQs on almost everything. Um, it's a good habit to get into. Uh, it kind of just keeps pieces where you want them to be. Almost any sample is going to have uh, tails in directions uh, that you don't want. So you can see even on the uh, in the pocket drums, I have it drop way off at uh, right around 100 hertz. Um, and that's just to keep everything, that's to keep my low end as clean as possible. Uh, and that might not mean a lot to you, but you'll hear tons and tons of people talking about, uh, you know, EQing stuff, like keeping everything open. You can kind of think of it as like a bucket. Um, you have your frequency range, and it's almost like you have a bucket that's full of different densities. Um, and so, you know, your lowest density, your oil or whatever on the bottom, you want that to be separate. So with this EQ8, um, it's just an Ableton audio effect. Highly, highly recommended. Uh, use that on almost everything. And uh, you can click on these little curves. It'll change how uh, how the curve operates. Uh, on anything that like mid-range and higher, you're going to want to use this uh, drop times four. Uh, and then same thing as an inverse. If you go over to the uh, you know, the other side of it, if you're doing low end stuff, you really are going to want to cut that hard um, just to leave room for all the pieces of the puzzle to be able to exist in the, in the final product. So if, if you're kind of doing some of that legwork as you, as you build, uh, you'll have to, you won't have to try as hard mixing your track later. Uh, it's kind of just a good habit to get into. Just, just throw an EQ8 on it and, and, boost and reduce the things that you want, but really pick a region of whether that's going to be low, mid, high, or like kind of ultra high or, or you know, sub bass and, and put that piece of the puzzle. Make sure with the EQ8 that, that you're lining it up in, uh, you know, in its little section uh, as best you can. Um, all right, let's get on to these drums. I honestly think that I just clicked these in at random and I knew I just went through here and uh, just picked out some sounds that I thought were interesting uh, and and I just went I just went crazy clicking them in so I've already got uh, my MIDI region uh, you can see in here it's totally blank uh, and I just started uh, I know I used a lot of those. Um, I'll just solo this for a while, and uh, I'm just gonna click some stuff in. Uh, actually, let's get our drums in here too. Sometimes it is just this easy. Uh, it doesn't always work this way. Um, you get enough good sounds though, and uh, let's see. check it out. There we go. That's the noise I like. Uh, I 
And you can see that once you have your kind of four on the floor kick, you can sort of just click in wherever you want. Um, I'll shut the metronome off so now we just have the kicks. Uh, kicks and the snares um, and all these other little kind of sprinkly sounds for in between and if I include that pocket drumming you can see we're actually starting to get somewhere now. So this is kind of where I had the drums set up and then I went over here and uh, I took my little travel keyboard um, and I dragged in uh, just a brushed bell sound. So I went into instruments. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, so it's in it's in mallets. Um, and really so much of this song was just like exploring and playing around with stuff and changing uh, Ableton parameters. I really didn't have like an end goal in mind. Um, I just I just knew I liked that sound. So if I if I play the drums now. Uh, I just sort of dabbled with that until I came up with this. Uh, and these are just chords uh, that I, you know, just, I played some of them, I clicked some of it in. Um, if you're having a hard time, you want to make chords, you can always use, like, just just work in triplets, or I mean in, in thirds. Um, and you can always change your your MIDI notes around. Just know that you're not locked into whatever it is you're playing like you would be if you were recording it's like a guitar into a microphone. Um, you really have a lot of malleability with MIDI, um, which is one of the reasons it's so fun to work with. Uh, so then we got this. Uh, and this is something that I played previously um, on the keyboard. There it is. Uh, you can see I, I don't know, I used to be able to play it. I can't anymore. Um, I think I might have actually played this just with, you know, a three, three note chord and then I added in that top one. Um, but that's really the driving melody for the whole song. And then here's where it gets really fun, because you can just start copying and pasting that around. Um, so check it out. I want, uh, I know I, I have a lot of these sounds I already uh, laid out, um, but this is a, I just, I literally just copy and pasted that MIDI information to Ableton's Grand Piano Sound, which you can find in the instruments um, tab. Uh, it's just in the instrument rack. You go into you go into your piano and keys, and uh, you know it's it's just they've had this sound forever. The sounds have gotten better. Um, the exact same MIDI that is that I'm using for this sound. Copy and paste it over to the grand piano. Sounds like this. So it does sound, sure, pretty similar. We still have it in a 16 bar loop. We can see over here, uh, you know, 400, zero, zero. that's gonna be kind of a nice uh, number to look for. 400, zero, zero. 200 zero, zero works too. You'd have an eight bar loop. 100, uh, zero, zero. you'd have a one bar loop. Um, it's just nice working in that in increment of four. You can also go up to 32, 64. Um, but if you have those 32 bar loops, they'll, they'll keep your project fairly simple. Um, and things will just start lining up. You can see here I've got 16 bar, 16 bar, 16 bar, 16 bar, 16 bar. Um, 
it can start to sound a little robotic if you get stuck into that, but don't worry about that uh, right now. It's just it's just nice to have to have all your puzzle pieces kind of line up without uh, worrying too much about that because it can get really messy really fast. Uh, all right, I might start working pretty quick here because I know we're running through the time and I want this to go fast. So one of the things that I ended up doing was just dragging these notes out. And you can see I'm selecting little regions. I'm just dragging everything. Uh, I want to make sure I'm only selected on the ones that I want to extend. But you can see I'm just dragging these MIDI notes out. Because all these MIDI notes are is computer information telling Ableton's telling the grand piano to play this note for that long. So I just made them uh, longer. So now it's the exact same MIDI as this brush bell one that we had before. Uh, but I just made the notes longer. So now we've got... Uh, And that's, I only played it once, uh, and if we play them together, they don't sound like the same MIDI. It also helps that I have these uh, EQ'd and compressed already. Uh, all right. All right, synced again. Uh, and we can do, we can keep doing this this copy and paste thing. Uh, one of the things that might hang you guys up a little bit is this fold button over here. Basically, what fold does is it takes. Say you've got a whole keyboard, you know, worth of notes. Uh, it takes the notes that you've used and compresses all that so that that's all you're seeing. So it takes all the notes you're not using and, and gets rid of those. So you can see that if I, I'll make this big real quick, if I hit fold, it actually adds, uh, you know, it adds in the notes that are in between. Like you can see this uh, C sharp. You can see over here, it'll tell you what, uh, what note you're trying to play. And you can see I used a lot of C4 and not a single C sharp. So when I hit fold, it just gets rid of that C sharp altogether. You can see how none of those notes are showing up anymore. Um, and uh, it just it just keeps it can kind of blow everything up so that uh, you can use you know, it, it allows you to see what you're working on a little more clearly in some cases. Um, I'm gonna do more dragging and dropping. I'm actually gonna take the piano uh, MIDI and I'm gonna drag that over here to this. It's another copied version of Brushed Bells, that first sound that I was using. The, that kind of chirpy one. Uh, exact same MIDI as the piano, okay? So it's gonna be notes that are held down. Uh, but I dragged uh, in the MIDI effects, I just dragged the arpeggiator onto this, uh, onto this track. Um, and I did mess around with it a lot. I knew I was working in the key of G. Uh, you can see here, even though I got it grayed out, um, just the parameters that I used. And, uh, you know, I didn't have a plan when I dragged and dropped this in. A lot of it was just kind of tweaking stuff until it sounded right. But you can hear it without the arpeggiator. It sounds still very similar. You can see it's compressed. I probably should have EQ'd it, but I didn't. But so even though these notes are long, uh, because it's a shorter pluck, it's not actually playing that note long. But if I turn on this arpeggiator, 
going to play the exact same information, but an arpeggiator is basically, it's the difference between um, playing a chord like so or playing it individually. So an arpeggiator will take my chord of uh, those four notes, and if I tell it to play all four of those notes at the same time and then put an arpeggiator on it, in its default state, it's going to do that. You can change it uh, how you, what order you want it to play the notes in. I have it to set to thumb up. To me, that was just what sounded the best. So without further ado, this is the brushed bells with the MIDI from the grand piano and an arpeggiator on it. Uh, and it sounds like this. Um, and then, so, so I have my, you can tell it sounds uh, very different than the original brush bells that we had. Um, so we took the exact same MIDI and just copied it over a few different times uh, and got three very drastically different things out of the exact same uh, sound. Uh, or the exact, the exact same notes. Um, I'm going to continue to mess around with this a little bit. One of the things that I wanted to happen, if I play both of these at the same time, they almost sound like one instrument, but one of the things that you can do in Ableton is uh, with a compressor is sidechain and what that essentially does is it takes you can imagine somebody's finger on the volume uh, it just slides the volume down some when another sound plays and you can pick what sound you want uh, you know to what you want to use as a trigger to reduce the volume um, and so I knew that I wanted these little brushed plucks uh, to kind of punch punch through that all the all the muddiness of the arpeggio. So uh, if you go in here, and you take a compressor. Uh, I'm actually gonna just get rid of that. I'll just do it all again. Um, you click on this little arrow. Uh, it'll open up some more parameters. You can hit side chain this little side chain button. I know I want my input to be. Is number my track nine brushed bell hits bells. So if I select that, it's not going to do anything at first, but you can tell as soon as I have that threshold all the way down, you can hear it starting to mute. So as I have both tracks playing, but because I'm soloing the brushed bells with the arpeggiator, you can hear that volume getting pulled down every time. The bells would hit. So then as soon as I, if I play them both again, you're going to hear that. You probably won't hear that volume duck as soon as they're both playing, but you'll hear that initial uh, brush bell track really come through a lot stronger. And a lot of, a lot of, almost any song that you've heard professionally on the radio or um, anything is as almost all of that is going to have some sort of side chain compression. You'll hear that a lot um, throughout the music industry. A lot of times people will put on a kick drum so that the kick punches through everything, and they'll they'll take a side chain and they'll put they'll group everything except for the drums in side chain all of that so that the drums are punching through. There's a lot of weird little routing tips and tricks um, that will and that side chain will really let. Uh, things that aren't show, shining through the mix, you can really kind of punch those things out with that side chain. Um, so now that we have all three of those, this is what they sound like together with the side chain compression. Um, I even, uh, you can see, so I'm sh hitting shift tab over here. I've already actually side chained the grand piano as well. Uh, 
to that same brushed bell. So they'll, they're, that brushed bell hit, this guy, is actually, I have it punching through both the grand piano. It's not as extreme as the arpeggio one, but you can hear all three of them together. It's still letting that still letting that bell punch through pretty hard, um, which is what I wanted. Uh, I wanted the piano and the arpeggio to kind of sit sit back behind, or even feel like they're part of that same instrument. Um, and to me, with all of that routed the way it did, uh, it really got things to the place that I wanted them to be. Um, just for the sake of it, let's hear it all together real quick. Uh, so this is going to be the drums minus the hi-hat uh, and uh, all three of those piano. Uh, moving on, moving on. Uh, next, I worked in some uh, some bass. Um, took me a while to find a bass line that worked. Uh, I think I might have actually even done it before I had the piano. So I think I had that and. Uh, uh, and I just kept trying to mess around with it. Uh, you can kind of just play around notes. Um, you can click stuff in if you if you feel like it. If you right click on uh, almost anything in the in like a grid for Ableton, you can change how you want uh, the grid to interact. And then if you click in notes, it's going to add. You know, it'll ch it'll change how how tight your grid pattern is, how big you want these notes to be. Uh, I'm way up in the octaves. You can kind of maybe hear a little chime here. Um, you can, if you learn your Ableton keyboard, uh, you can really get. You can use your keyboard to actually play things if you don't have a MIDI keyboard. Um, a lot of times I'll do that if I'm just on the road. Uh, you got to make sure this little this little piano key is checked up in the top. And um, let's see if I can find my... There it is. So you can see I'm playing C1 on my computer's keyboard. And you can see that whether I'm playing my MIDI keyboard or I'm playing my computer keyboard, the same note's going to come through. So you get, I think, about a little less than one octave, or a little more than one octave. I'm getting a lot more out of my MIDI keyboard, which is why it's nice um, to have uh, you know, it's just easier to play more notes at the same time. Um, you can jump this up and down uh, octaves if you want to. Same thing with the Ableton keyboard. If you hit X or Z, you will jump up or down the keyboard uh, octave range, respectively. So depending on what you're playing, whether you're playing piano or bass or whatever, um, you do the same thing with piano. So you can hear them real low in the oct octaves. Um, it just kind of is another playability feature that uh, you sort of get locked in uh, if you've got that box checked. A little piano roll key. Um, just something you can A and B if you're feeling stuck or you don't have a MIDI keyboard at this point. Um, can kind of keep you going. Uh, so I'm just gonna 
this is the MIDI I ended up playing. Um, if I solo this. And I know that's wrong. So my glide is way up here. So I, uh, this is where you can kind of, so it must have gotten bumped or something. Um, but if I take my keyboard, if, or if I take my MIDI keyboard, you can see that glide changing. You can obviously go in here and click and, and drag stuff around. You can always double click on any Ableton parameter and it will reset to its default state. That can be a really helpful tool um, for something like that if you start to get other pieces of equipment plugged into your computer. Uh, you know, something gets bumped, it, your sound just doesn't sound right. I know that's not, doesn't sound the way I wanted it to when I was playing it. Um, so I double clicked that glide because you could tell that it was. Uh, taking a really long time to glide around. I don't want that much glide. I'm just going to double click on it real quick. Um, that sounds a lot closer to what I uh, was playing. Uh, all of these sounds, again, are exclusively found in Ableton. I'm using Ableton 10. Um, but I just found them in the instruments tab and adjusted the parameters until I found them to be uh, kind of what I, the sound I was I was going for. Um, and so a lot of it is EQing, compressing, changing around your uh, you know your parameters here for this specifically for the sound. Um, you can do a lot of kind of sound design even in the instrument tab of uh, like the, the preset sound. Um, get rid of these real quick. I kind of had a, a nice little cheat sheet down here um, if I needed it. Just so I didn't have to play every single MIDI note over again. Um, and then one of the things that I did here, you can see I've got it I've got my EQ dropped times four again, and this is on the bass too. So I'll click on this little arrow. It's gonna blow this up. Uh, you can see the bass really wants to go. It goes a lot, like you can see this tail that curves in. Um, the reason I have it EQ'd like this is because I wanted sub bass. Um, to fill in that lowest end and that's really where stuff's gonna like shine through in subs um, and It's just nice to have it separated you can keep it cleaner and By the time you play it uh, Nobody's ever gonna know that you have them separated, but it's gonna make it so much more Professional so much easier to mix if you get it mixed or mastered later uh those people will be very happy that you separated your sub bass and bass. Um, so one of my go-to Ableton effects, even if I'm using all the plugins that I have, um, I'll almost always use uh, Hip Hop Sub, which is a uh, an instrument in Ableton uh, that is just such a clean sine wave and it's so it just adds such a nice like low end thickener uh, i end up using it all the time you can't tell that it's an ableton plugin um, it's just a really clean uh sine wave and uh a lot of times i'll just copy and paste my bass midi over um you're not gonna be able to hear this if you don't have have headphones in um even with headphones, it's going to be really pretty subtle. I have it mixed down too, so that um, I can always add more later. But for those of you who can, if you can hear that, congratulations, you have nice headphones. If you can't, I'm sorry. Uh, you should probably get headphones that will allow you to hear that. You don't need nice ones. Um, I got these Sennheisers at a garage sale for 20 bucks. Um, 
they're probably 15, 20 years old, they will play that note. Um, you don't need expensive equipment, but you do need to be able to hear what you are playing. Uh, if you can't, it makes it very hard. Um, so again, this is just the bass and the sub bass. Just copy and paste it over. Um, you're not, you might not be able to hear this, especially recorded into my computer microphone. Ooh. I don't want to hear it all yet. We'll get there soon. Um, even on these fairly expensive studio monitors, I can't tell a difference. You're probably not going to be able to tell a difference with it picking up through my computer and then playing out through your headphones. Um, it's a subtle difference, but I promise it makes a huge difference. And you can see that this sub bass, I have this EQ'd to be a very small region. Uh, so it goes from 100 hertz down to 20 hertz. And the reason I have it rolled off there, again, is because underneath that point of 20 hertz, you really aren't hearing the sound anymore. It's all within bones and feeling. Um, and uh, if you limit the range of your bass, it'll kind of leave more room for speakers to hit like it'll still try to hit those notes below 20 hertz but you won't uh you're kind of leaving more room for the speaker to 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 drive in some cases so uh depending on what i'm doing i will just uh roll the low end off uh even though it's sub bass um and just in some cases it'll just make it more punchy uh and then lastly we have this little uh this little vocoder uh, sound. And a lot of this was just me shopping around in, uh, in instruments, just wondering, you know, uh, you know, kind of what, what I could find. So I think I found this in the voice, uh, you know, in the voices section over here. And it was just one of these, you know. It can be really nice uh, to navigate around. You can just use arrow keys. Uh, you can use up and down. And if you hit uh, forward, uh, you know, or, or the arrow right, it will actually play that uh, sample. Um, so that can be a really great way when you're shopping around for samples. Uh, and and, uh, and finding things that you want to integrate. Uh, you know, and so some of these are just, uh, you know, claps and stuff, and and I'm just in my master's sample, uh, master sample library. Um, but that was sort of, you know, you can do the same thing with your with your instruments, uh, and you can actually play along with stuff. So if if I know, let's say I've got these. If I'm back over here trying to sh trying to find sounds, uh, sorry, some of those are a little loud, but you get the idea. Um, you know, I can go in here and. And I gotta pick what I thought sounded like it it matched um and i ended up with this uh you know what's this little vocoder thing and so that just sort of tacks in on the end um i just when i arranged it i just felt like i needed uh something a little spicier for the last uh the last kind of chorus kick um and that's all the sounds that I have integrated in this file. And I am planning on sharing this file with you guys at the end of this. Um, so that if you want to poke around and see what uh, kind of specifically what I did and changed it around, I highly suggest that when you open it, you save as so that if you want to mess around with it, uh, you can really take things and run with them and then still have your original uh, 
the original file that I gave you guys. Um, so you can really get into the deep end uh, and uh, kind of mess around with it. Um, the last thing that I did here was I went through the samples and after I had everything playing, uh, I went through my sample library. Uh, I just picked stuff that was either, uh, you know, that, that I thought would go well with with the mix. Um, just little kind of one shots and you know uh, sound effects, little drops and stuff. Uh, a lot of these you probably won't even be able to hear. Uh, some of them you will. They get pretty heavily uh, automated um, when they're actually in the mix um, and they add but they add a lot of of kind of subtle variety um, and it, it's I really do feel like it's it's kind of like your salt and pepper uh, you're not changing any any real um, you know, you're not adding any like any more real substance. You're just adding. It's almost like if you bring them down in the mix enough, it's just like a feeling level. Um, especially with like white noise and things like that, uh, it'll just kind of fill up that uh, frequency spectrum and uh, make the sound feel that much bigger uh, when you need it to. Um, so I keep you see me keep clicking over to the uh, arrangement view. We are getting. We are getting set up to, to play that here. Um, I'm going to just get rid of some of this stuff. And I will go through real quick. And you can see that uh, I do have a lot of these things EQ'd and compressed. Uh, I actually ended up putting a gate on my pocket drums. And that that will just like kind of cut out the, cut out the sound at a certain threshold. Um, and a lot of these are just uh, me dragging and dropping audio effects on here, trying them out. If they don't work, I get rid of it and try a different one. Um, a lot of it is just experimenting and, and kind of figure, you know, you'll start to build confidence and you'll start to build kind of sounds and things that you like. Um, and so real quick, let's go through. You can see that I have an, an EQ on the majority of this. Uh, you can also, oh, a huge thing, Command-R will rename anything you're selected on, um, and Command-G will put things into groups. So you can see I've got all of my drums, whether it's the pocket drums, the thing I recorded on my phone, a kick drum, the drum loops, or the hi-hats. I just put, I selected all those, just shift-click, uh, and then you just hit Command-G, and it throws them all in to one channel and you can throw audio effects on that too so a lot of people will throw a compressor on that and it kind of glues everything together because um, you have all of those sounds getting routed in through and out of one compressor and so then if I know if I have my drums mixed right then I can bring those down in the group with the, the mix of the whole rest of the thing it's just kind of getting all those steps in line uh, will help you a lot uh, in the end uh, same thing, you know, you already saw the uh, grand piano. We have it side-chained to the brushed bells. Um, so those things are connected. Uh, you can see the EQ8. I've got it rolled rolled off pretty heavily at, uh, let's see here if we can, around 50-something. I could probably bring that to 100, and you would never really notice in the mix. Um, it's going to sound very similar. Uh, these brush bells doesn't actually look like I have a compressor or anything on. So I'm just going to throw one on, uh, throw a compressor and an equalizer. If I solo this, um, you can see that I'm getting a lot of little low end stuff in here. That is, there's no way we're hearing that. But you can visually see that it's in there in the mix. Um, I don't want that. The larger you blow this up, either in volume or like speaker-wise or whatever, that's gonna start to come through. Even on like an unhearable level, it'll come through as like distortion or something. Um, so again, I'm gonna go through and uh, 
change this curve to uh, times four, and I'm going to roll this off at 102. Um, probably not hearing the difference, but it will make a difference in the end. Uh, well, same thing with this. I don't have any EQ8, so I'm going to drag this on, roll that bottom off. Honestly, I'm not even going to listen to it. I just know that it's going to sound a little better. Uh, sub bass, you can see I do have that rolled off. I have it compressed. I have it rolled off on both sides because I don't want any of this high end bass, which it does have some of. You can see if I play a note here, there's little aliases down here in the top half trying to come through. So by rolling that top down some, uh, it just kind of reduces that high-end frequency. Uh, you can also see over here in this woofer-loving bass sound, I actually have it, the frequency rolling off quite a bit also. So uh, kind of both of those are going through to, to let less high-end come through uh, this bass sound. Um, and oh, I guess the last thing I didn't go over was this little brown version. Uh, it's just a, a different, simple MIDI. Uh, just for a few little like breakdowny parts. I it doesn't sound like anything on its own, but you can see when we go over, hop over to the arrangement view, it'll be the brown section. Uh, it's the same bass sound with just different MIDI. Uh, I just had a few options there depending on whether I want it to be kind of like excited bass. You know, it is fairly busy. Um, and if I just had this sound running the whole time throughout the whole song, you get real sick of it real fast. Um, and again, I just copy and pasted that uh, bass over uh, to the sub bass as well. Um, just to kind of fill in that low end. Uh, and then we have, I guess I could go over the MIDI of, of, uh, what that vocoder ended up being, huh? Um, just kind of all over the place. Uh, I don't know if it's going to sound like that when I play it. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. It sounds a little funny. It doesn't sound exactly like I, uh, the way I had it, but, uh, I'm just double clicking on all this just to see. I'm not sure why that sounds like it does. It might have to go away for the uh, final playthrough because, uh, yeah, it doesn't sound like how I remember routing it. And sometimes that happens. I do have it saved in another project um, that should be totally untouched. Uh, but now that we're here, um, I've gone over pretty much every component of this song uh and then the arrangements like a totally that's something that is its own skill in itself but essentially once you have these different regions you can drag these over and put them wherever you want in your uh arrangement view and i'm just switching over to that real quick i'm clicking and dragging and then if i hit tab really quick it just jumps back and forth and you can see uh that it's tab 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 you know um so wherever I want this to be, uh, you can kind of you can you know drag your regions over, uh, and and sort of build your song up that way. Um, so I'm going to shut up now and show you what this song sounds like in its entirety. I do have the vocoder muted, but you can see that. Got my bass, my sub bass, um, the brushed bells. This is the red stuff is the arpeggiated ones. Uh, that middle one is the original, and then we have the piano. 
Got a little bit of hi-hat, which we never actually did go over, but it's just a simple, it's just clicking some stuff in. It only happens a few points in the song. Um, and uh, I think that's all the components. We might just hit play on this and uh, I'll kind of let you guys see what happens. I am going to change my preferences around real quick. Uh, I have it routed through the speaker output right now. Um, I'm going to change it to uh, this other one. It's just a digital mic. Oh, you might not be able to hear me anymore. No, you should still be able to hear me. Uh, but it's going to play the Ableton audio uh, through a digital mic and record it into the screen capture software. So hopefully you guys will hear this as like an auxiliary instead of through the computer's microphone. Um, so without further ado, here's this song in, uh, in its entirety. And I'll zoom in and then hit follow so you can kind of see it uh, as it plays along. And, uh, Uh, all right, thank you. That can um, that concludes this uh, part of my little session. Um, hopefully, you guys have no problems opening this up in your own um, own projects, kind of messing around with it. Um, feel free to do whatever you want with it. Uh, yeah, I hope you learned a few things. And uh, if you have any questions for me. Hopefully I can be available for, um, you know, for questions and comments. You can email me, uh, parnold641 at gmail.com. Um, I'd love to hear some of the stuff you guys are working on. Maybe Cody can share some stuff with me. Maybe I can come in and be, uh, you know, join you guys for a Zoom call. Um, break this down a little further if you have more questions. Um, other than that, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you.